Welcome. Uh, I'm Randy Pritikin. I'm the chief curator at the CJM. Um, the CJM's mission is to make the diversity of the Jewish experience relevant for a 21st century audience. We accomplish this through innovative exhibitions and programs that educate challenge and we hope inspire. We're of course thrilled to be the current presenters of Stanley Kubrick, the exhibition. The show draws on Kubrick's personal archives uh, and the exhibition features his early photographs for Look magazine when he was just a teenager, uh, along with set models, costumes, props, and uh, scripts, and many other items uh, that highlight his career, not only uh, as a groundbreaking uh, film director, but a career that spanned five decades and uh, defined or redefined the genres in which he worked. Uh, Anastasia James has been the CJM's curator in charge of the exhibition. She did a brilliant job as liaison with uh, the folks from Frankfurt. Um, she's been with us the better part of a year, moving here from New York. We're very excited to have her, and this is her first uh, panel discussion. She's going to be moderating it and introduce the panelists. Stanley Kubrick was born in New York City on July 26, 1928. He grew up in the Bronx, where his father worked as a doctor. He never adjusted to or did very well in school, and his early ambitions were to become a writer or play baseball. As he later remembered, I started out thinking if I couldn't play for the Yankees, I'd be a novelist. He displayed early promise as a photographer for his high school's newspaper, and at the age of 16, he sold his first photograph to Look magazine. A year later, he was hired for the staff of that magazine, and when not traveling for them, he spent most of his evenings at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Towards the end of his high school career, he applied to several colleges, but was turned down by all of them. In the 1950s, he began to explore the art of filmmaking. His first films were documentary shorts, and his first feature, the 1953 military drama, Fear and Desire, was made independently of a studio, a very uncommon practice for the time. Early into his filmmaking career, Kubrick acted as a cinematographer, editor, and sound man, in addition to directing. Later, he would also write and produce. Between 1957 and 1998, he made 10 acclaimed feature films, including Spartacus, Lolita, Dr. Strangelove, The Shining, A Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. In the early 1960s, he moved to England with his family, and it is said he kept mostly to a schedule of working at night and sleeping during the day, which allowed him to keep North American time. It is also said that during this time, he had a sister, Mary, tape the Yankees in NFL games, particularly those of the New York Giants, which were airmailed to him. He died in his sleep at his home in Childwickbury Manor in England on March 7, 1999, hours after delivering a print of what would be his final film, Eyes Wide Shut to the Studio. Tonight on our panel, we welcome a number of individuals who in various ways were involved with Stanley Kubrick or his legacy. Our first guest, Jan Harlan, worked for Kubrick as an executive producer on all of his films from Barry Lyndon forward. He was instrumental in the formation of the Kubrick Archive at the University of Arts London, where the bulk of the works in the exhibition originated. Our second guest, Katerina Kubrick, in addition to being Kubrick's daughter, has an adorable German shepherd, which I learned recently, <laughs> is a true Renaissance woman. She's a painter, jewelry designer, and photographer, and has held many jobs in the film industry, including prop designer, model maker, location researcher, set designer, and ultimately art director. And our third guest, Tim Hepner, is a curator at the Deutsche Film Museum and tour manager of Stanley Kubrick. In addition to curating many exhibitions, he has been managing the Film Museum's international exhibition tours. He has been with us for the past three weeks installing the exhibition. And finally, I would like to mention Hans-Peter Reichmann, who's unable to join us tonight. He is the head of collections and senior curator at the Deutsche Film Museum and curator of Stanley Kubrick, the exhibition. He has curated and edited numerous exhibitions and related catalogs on subjects ranging from West German post-war films, film architecture, to Marlena Dietrich, Klaus Kinski, 
Rainer Werner Fassbinder, and Charlie Chaplin. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to open up the panel by asking our guests to share their first memory of Stanley Kubrick. Um, I'm sure they will all have varied answers. And then, in Tim's case, I would like to ask him what his first memory was of meeting Jan and Katerina and Christiane and the family. Well, my, my first real proper meeting with him was when I was a young man in, in, in New York. I lived in New York. He then came from London uh, with Dr. Strangelove. He, he was married to my sister and had, they have three little girls. Catherine was maybe, I don't know, five or six. And um, the others were babies. And um, uh, yeah, I, I met him at dinner and we, we chatted. I wasn't all that interested, really. I, I was interested <laughs> in my life. And I had, uh, you know, I did other things. I mean, he just happened to be the husband of, of, of my wife, okay? I mean, I met him before briefly, <laughs> but I didn't really all that much. You know, yeah, you know, I, I was. How old were you? Yeah, but then uh, over the uh, next uh, months, I got to know him, him fairly well, and uh, I met him very often together with Arthur C. Clarke, and, and of course at dinner, and I, I realized that they never stopped talking about, in this case, about a, a some kind of a space thing. They were constantly, actually, they were in love with their own insignificance. I think, <laughs> I think, I think this is really a, a very, very precise because they were always talking about how small everything is, how, how, uh, how unimportant the Earth is, and how endless, and they threw out, you know, 100 million, billion stars and all that stuff, and the endlessness, and we could never know, but, we, but we, because we'd never know, we can be sure. There are so many, many more things that we have no idea of. It's unthinkable that they are not. So, yeah, and, uh, and my first impression was this is a bit like a, a young man being in love with a girl. Um, you know, this total obsession. Yeah, they, they never talk about anything else. Um, and I found that very interesting. But then, you know, it was not none of my business. And um, I, I had my own profession, I did my own stuff. Uh, but I, I formed a basic relationship. And then I went back to Europe, I got married, we had a baby, and they got back and, and did finally this film, which was called 2001 A Space Odyssey. We visited regularly, uh, once a year or so in England, and it was years later, in 69, when he asked me to join him for one year, maybe, to go to Romania on a film project, Napoleon. Thank you, Jan. Katrina, what's your earliest memory? <clears throat> okay, I was obviously very little when um, he met my mum, uh, who we saw on television. He went to Germany to make a film called Paths of Glory, and he needed an actress for the end scene, and called her agent, and she came for an interview, and they obviously fell madly in love. Um, and the film was shot in sequence, so by the time it was her bit at the end of the movie, they were already together. I don't remember him during that time, but what I do remember is going to California with my mother um, so that she could marry Stanley and him sitting me on his knee and saying, call me daddy. And because um, at the, that point in my little German girl accent, I was calling him Stanley, like my mother. Um, and it, I reminded him of that when a million years later, I was visiting him on the set of Eyes Wide Shut. I had dropped my boys off at school, went to visit because the location was quite near. And um, I don't know, he was across the set or something and I called him daddy. And he, and he came up and said, don't call me daddy on set. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I never met Stanley Curry personally. I was, um, I, 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 and I remember very well when I saw um, his, fir his, when I first saw one of Stanley Curry's movies. I was a 15 year old teenager, and I went to a friend's home place and we watched a VHS cassette um, from a video cassette from A Clockwork Orange. And uh, I remember very well that this film really hit me and um, I, I felt attracted and on the other hand I was very worried and it frightened me and I can still remember that it, um, this feeling of uh, confusion 
stayed with me through one or two days, and I, I never had um, such a, I never experienced uh, a film to have, to have such an impact on me before. Um, and I met Jan Harlan years later um, in 2003 when I was a young curator at the German Film Museum in Frankfurt, and my colleague had already um, arranged the cooperation between the Film Museum and um, the family of Stanley Kubrick, and I joined him um, for a travel to St. Albans, and uh, I think we, we were there to, to load a bunch of camera uh, equipment that uh, Mr. Joe Dunton had kept in his rental company place um, during the, and we took it during the preparation of the exhibition and, and brought it uh, on a ferry boat to Frankfurt. Uh, that was the first um, time I visited St. Albans and met Christiane Kubrick and Jan Harlan. Interesting. I guess I'll follow up with that by asking Katerina a question about kind of the home and the estate and what was it, what was the environment like that Kubrick lived in, that you lived in? Um, Okay. I know you told me a wonderful story about your bedroom being all the way at the top of the house. <laughs> um, well, imagine, if you like, an artist and a filmmaker living together. Um, basically, whether we were living in an apartment in New York or a flat in London or a house in Elstree, it was a combination of film studio and art college. So pretty fertile ground. Um, and Daddy liked to sleep in his own bed at night. Um, and be surrounded by his family and his pets and, and, and work on his films. So people came to him. So our houses, wherever we were living, were big enough to accommodate offices. And usually it was just about every room in the house, actually, apart from bedrooms, that were turned into some kind of screening room, meeting room, production office, accountant's office, um, secretary's office, you know, if there was a cottage, that would all be offices upstairs and my mother's studio downstairs. Um, and at one house that we lived at, my little bedroom was right at the top and I had to run past Jan's office, Margaret's office, and Ross's office, go down the stairs to get to the bathroom. Um, and so it was, it was busy. It was, it was busy all the time. And the busiest times uh, were when uh, editing, I suppose, was happening, or or um, because if he was shooting, he wasn't he wasn't home. But if he was editing or in pre-production, then everybody would come to us. And when he was preparing 2001, Arthur C. Clarke, and uh, you know every kind of expert you can imagine was coming to the house and visiting. Um, and then when he was editing, it would be editors and people running around and assistants. Uh, Lunch was always, you know, six, seven to ten people every day. It, busy. It was really busy. Sounds like it. Um, Jan, I have a question for you. Um, Kubrick's often known as being finicky, but yet you mentioned there were times when he had to compromise or compromises were made. Um, can you maybe talk about that a little bit? Yes, he, he was very exacting and he wanted to really to really get things right. But on the other hand, uh, what was more important, that he was art satisfied artistically. There are a number of examples. Uh, one example that comes to mind is the, the casting of Full Metal Jacket. Um, we, we tried to get 19-year-old uh, people, young men for, uh, from the whole um, uh, Chicago area. We couldn't find seven really good actors. It's very, very difficult. Uh, and then we gave up and we went up to the age group 26, 27, which is incorrect for, for the Marines to take her, but they were really good actors. So that is a, that's what I mean. He was absolutely ready to make a compromise, although you could say the casting is incorrect. Mm -hmm. So what? Or and let's say the music in Barry Lyndon. The, he loved the Schubert piano trio. He knew um, it was too late. It, you know, it was 30 years out of time, uh, but you know, he said, oh, I mean, you know, he just couldn't get that kind of romantic moment from Haydn, Mozart, or people before. So he went to, to, to the Schubert Trio. These are just two examples where he was absolutely ready to make a compromise, but otherwise he really wanted to make sure that everything is correct. Yeah. Do you think he became less exacting or finicky as he got older, or 
Was this something he carried on from his very early films all the way in through to his final film? Uh, I, I can't say because uh, no, I mean, uh, okay, the, the, the Schubert example was Barry Lyndon, but then in, in Eyes Wide Shut, um, no, he, I mean, Eyes Wide Shut was so complicated for him that you, you can't even talk about a compromise. But uh, for example, the so called orgy that is in Eyes Wide Shut. It is not an orgy at all, it's a modern hell. You know, he had Hieronymus Bosch in mind. He, he and, and uh, the first assistant and, and myself, we, we pointed out that maybe a bit complicated, maybe people don't get this. Um, I, 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 he, no, he, he was absolutely determined, and I love that. I love this determination. He had his vision, and whether it was totally correct or not doesn't really matter. For example, we suggested that he should have a so-called cover shot, whereby there's a lot of nudity in that scene. Mm -hmm. Is that just dress these people with a gown in case you get into trouble with a censor? They are not that stupid, you know. That was the answer. No, no. I mean, you know, he, he he couldn't see that because for him, if anything indecent was in that scene, it was the voyeurs, mm. and not what they are watching. Mm -hmm. But you know, that is too subtle. Uh, uh, anyway, so yeah, I, I don't know whether I have answered your question. I actually yeah. have a, just to interrupt. I was talking to Nigel Galt when we were in Paris. Nigel Galt was the editor on Eyes Wide Shut. And yes, of course, Stanley was very exacting and very particular, and, and, but he was also an artist. And um, he, he loved the, the photograph and he loved the composition. And two examples, I went to visit him when he was shooting the party sequence for Eyes Wide Shut. And everything was lit by the Christmas lights. That, there was no film lights, that was how he shot it. So he had to you know, change it, put a different exposure on the film, cook it longer at the lab, and he was looking at it on the steam bag, so the colors were very saturated and very lush, and he was so excited. He said, look, how gorgeous is this? Doesn't it look beautiful? Years later, we're at the Paris exhibition with Nigel Gold, and we're sitting in the bar afterwards, and um, we're starting talking Stanley stories. And um, <laughs> so there's the sequence in, in Eyes Wide Shut where you have the circle of, the, of all the women um, with their masks and they're robed and then they're disrobed and then they're chosen and taken away. And um, apparently it was noticed after the scene was cut together, Nigel pointed it out to, to Dad. He said, you know, that girl in the master shot, she should be gone. And apparently, Daddy said to him, ah, they'll be so busy looking at her tits, they'll never notice. <laughs> On that note, um, I think that a lot of the points that you've brought up about him being a true artist and being very determined really comes across in the exhibition, where we see over a thousand objects related to how he made films. Um, Tim, I want to ask you about when the exhibition was conceived um, about these unfinished projects and the material that you found related to them. And was it surprising? Did you, was this the first time anyone had seen this material? Yes, I mean, for us it was very surprising because um, in the publications, uh, of course, um, his occupation with, I, I, I picked Napoleon as the best example. Um, so it was, it was, um, has been reported, but I think for the very first time we were, sorry, we were really able to um, sift through the actual material and um, make a selection that uh, is now visible in the exhibition. And um, uh, at the time when we were preparing our exhibition, uh, the Taschen Publishing Company, they had also an editor um, who made a big book, uh, the Stanley Kubrick Archives, and then followed by another book, Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon, um, which for the very first time um, gave a really detailed insight into the research and pre-production process for this never finished film. And um, so I think, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great surprise for us. It was very satisfying to, to find this vast amount of materials and, um, yeah. And, uh, could you talk a little bit about that one letter that we don't know who it's addressed to in mm -hmm. the exhibition and what it says? 
Yeah, we'll, we show in the exhibition in a vitrine case um, source of research and pre-production material correspondence with actors that were designated as main cast, for, for instance, Oscar Werner. And so we put these items all in a chronological order. And um, the film was abandoned uh, in 1969, but there is a draft of a letter that Kubrick wrote, or maybe it is even some sort of self addressed letter in which he sums up the actual state of things and um, he says it is impossible to tell you what I'm going to do except to say that I expect to make the best movie ever made and that was that was even after um, the project has been put down and it shows that he was still I think trying to find ways or new approach to have it uprise again Another one of our, another section in the exhibition that's of particular interest to many of our visitors is the section related to the Aryan Papers film, which was also an unfinished project. Um, Katarina, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that project and why it was never finished. Um, well, I actually think, I mean, Jan is actually the person Jan, you should you really talk to, but I can tell you just very quickly that we were quite far along um, and a house had been rented and fences have been put up for our, to take our dogs with us. I took my boys out of school um, so that we could move to Holland. Um, so we were really far along in preparation, but I think Jan can fill you in on a bit. Uh, well, he was, as long as I know him, he wanted to make a film about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make a film about the biggest crime in the history of, of mankind. And, um, the first time it sizzled out, he just didn't, he, he, very quickly, because he couldn't find a good story. He was not at all interested in a documentary. Anyway, Lanzmann made a fantastic documentary and that is done a bit later. But then uh, we, we had a big run up on, 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 on suggesting to Isaac Beshevis Singer to write for us an original screenplay because it was Singer. First of all, we loved his material. And he, he said himself uh, that everybody has a story to tell. And, and he was surrounded in New York by refugees. And, and so he, he, I mean, there was no question. And I remember my wife was with me. We, 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 the two of us went to, to visit Singer, and it's an official mission. And uh, yeah, well, lovely man. And he said, oh, yes, I'm so honored. And he loved Barry Lyndon. And yeah, I went on and on and on. And then we stated our case. We could he write an original screenplay for Stanley Kubrick, a Shakespearean type of, of, really, of drama set on the Holocaust? And he said, well, I'm very honored, but there's a huge problem. Well, what is that? And he said, literally, word for word, I don't know the first thing about it. I, I, I got the point. I called Stanley two hours later, and he dropped the topic for 20 years until he hit on Louis Begley's novel, Wartime Lies, and he was encouraged again because there, this young boy, he, that, that was the writer, so there was authenticity. He knew he was there. Yeah. He, he, he knew exactly why. Why Singer said he doesn't know the first thing about it. He felt he, somebody who has to be, has to be there. Anyway, so we were encouraged, we bought the rights to the book, and we spent, oh, a long time on pre preparing it. I did, uh, with others, uh, location research in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, we were already as far as having the permission to close the city center of, of uh, Brno, uh, a city in, in, in the Czech Republic. At that time, it was still Czechoslovakia and uh, get Nazi flags down and get the trams from the tram museum out and the cities were very, very far advanced. And um, then came Terry Semmel, a boss of Warner Brothers, and called Stanley and said, look, Stanley, just, uh, yeah, I mean, I want to tell you that uh, Stephen is making a film in Krakow about the same topic. Not exactly sure what it is, but, you know, it's a bad timing because you're going to be about six, seven, eight months later Ah, not good. Let's postpone it. And so, yeah, it was postponed. And I, I know that Stanley was uh, um, very sad and also a little bit relieved because it became so depressing, this story, 
but yeah, the, the Warner Brothers still, I think, have the rights to, to the book. And, and uh, to, I met Louis Begley twice, wonderful man. He lives in New York. And he indeed was this little boy, my Czech, that, that uh, is, is the center figure together with his aunt. Uh, and, and aunt and uh, nephew are sl sliding through the uh, uh, net of, of Nazi occupation in Poland at that time. Yeah, and then um, yeah, it was postponed. He focused on, on AI, artificial intelligence, another story he had loved for many, many years. And what happens, he offers this, after a year of further pre-production, to Steven Spielberg. Now, you couldn't make this up, could you? But that's the truth. <laughs> and he finally, he finally did Dream Novel. Mm -hmm. That's a story for which he bought the rights in 1970 already. That and would be the book novel that became Eyes Wide Shut. That became Eyes Wide Shut. He was all, always, but he was wrestling with this. He was so self-critical and so demanding until he really, and okay, and then I know in about oh, 79 or 80, he suddenly was very, very happy. He had a new idea of how to do dream novel. That's what it was called, or dream story. He wanted to do it as a cheap art house movie, always in New York with Woody Allen in the lead as a Jewish doctor in New York and shooting it in Dublin and in London. And then he was still not happy with his script and he gave up again. So he finally, finally did Eyes Wide Shut and he considered it his greatest contribution to, to the art of, of filmmaking. Uh, yeah, not everybody agreed with him. The film was very, very successful in the Latin countries and in Japan, a total flop in the English-speaking world. But it's coming up. It's coming up. More and more people realize what a great film it is. Why is it such a great film? Because, uh, why is it such a great film? Because it tackles a topic where everybody here in this room is an expert. Jealousy and sexual fantasy. And that gets a bit near most people. I mean, it's not comfortable. You know, it's much better to look at James Bond because, you know, you have nothing to do with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, and, and, you know, people go, 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 go to the movies because they want to be entertained. They don't want to be challenged. Uh, and obviously in, in Japan, this is different. In, in France, Italy, and Spain, where it was very successful. I remember I got a, a fax from the uh, manager of the Warner Brothers office in Tokyo. And it said, um, it's absolutely amazing what this film is doing. Couples are leaving the cinema holding hands. It's incredible. Which brings me to my next question, which is, I, I think I know what the answer to this question is for you, but for Tim and Katarina, I'm not so sure. I'd, I'd like to know what your favorite film is by Kubrick, and also, what film you think is the most important. And they may not be the same, but they, they could be. Well, each film represents part of my growing up, so it's very difficult for me to be completely objective. And as I get older, um, the films have different meanings for me. Um, I see more in them all the time. Um, at the moment, I think every TV station in the Western world should screen Dr. Strangelove every day. Um, because I think it's probably more appropriate than ever. Um, I just, I happen to love that film. I was a child when it was being made, um, but I think it's still very powerful and very appropriate. I love Barry Lyndon. I worked on Barry Lyndon. I like Eyes Wide Shut because um, it's such a powerful movie, very affecting, and because it was Daddy's last film. And I remember him being very nervous because uh, he sent the, the print off with Leon to London to meet with Tom and Nick and the guys from Warner Brothers for them to see it for the first time. And he was always very nervous, really, really nervous. And because um, it, it was his baby. He'd been working on it for forever. Um, and I called him up and um, a couple of days later and I said, so how did it go? And he went, it couldn't be better. They loved it. I'm as happy as I could possibly be. And two later, he died. Tim? Well, yeah, it's, it's really hard. I, I don't have one particular favorite. I think um, for me, um, since this oeuvre is so 
divergent and since he has worked in so many different genres and his movies are so um, same but different, I mean, personally, I really find Dr. Strangelove a really very strong and um, extremely well acted, written, conceived, in its tone, brilliantly set movie. Um, I also think that 2001 has set a standard in a genre like the science fiction genre um, that was at that time really absolutely outstanding. Um, so, but also if you look at Barry Lyndon and the achievement and the innovative um, camera work that is included there, they all have their very particular stylistic, um, how can I say, um, methods and strong narratives. So having seen them quite often, I, I really must say um, they, they never lose any of the impact they have. And um, I, I, li I really like to see the whole oeuvre of him. So from his first feature films until the latest. So you don't like the documentaries very much? <laughs> well, I mean, um, they are certainly part of his um, learning process and um, they are of great importance for him to become a feature film director. Um, but I guess they were, I mean, they were, they represent the first steps of a very talented um, photographer into the art of filmmaking. And um, Day of the Fight is a, is a very well balanced and well conceived nine minute short um, about an interesting topic and following a day in the world of a, of a boxer, a prize fighter. Um, so I do like them. He also was a film buff oh, himself. Tell me more. Well, he, he, I, mean, I remember so well when he watched uh, Radio Days by Woody Allen twice uh, within two days because he, it was like watching a home movie, he told me. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's not such a great film, but he absolutely adored it. He loved flamenco films. Huh. He, he, he liked very, very much Blood Wedding by, by Carlos Saura. Mm -hmm. yeah? But he also liked the classics like you know, Citizen Kane and Casablanca, and he loved E.T. and Close Encounters. So he, was, you know, he very often had on the weekend six, seven films in, the, in the, our projection booths. He got from everybody, he could borrow films, no problem at all, because he returned them in perfect order, rewound professionally. <laughs> so, uh, and, and uh, yeah, and, and we watched the first reel, and if he really didn't satisfy him, he just and go to the next movie. But he watched almost, you know, uh, he, he really watched everything that is, he considered necessary to watch. He was very well informed. He was also a political beast. I'm missing his running comment on what's going on in the world. I mean, ay ay ay. What would he be saying now? <laughs> What would he be saying now? Well, I mean, he would certainly have his, uh, his say on Brexit, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and it would connect directly to the foolishness of, let's say, the reaction to 9-11 or to Napoleon. Mm -hmm. All people who are powerful people who are shooting in their own foot. Mm -hmm. yeah? Napoleon had nobody else to blame but himself for his demise. Mm -hmm. It was just stupid. And he was so successful and so talented and so brilliant and so dumb. So he continued to his obsession with Napoleon up until his... Well, I mean, <laughs> Napoleon was a big, big topic, and he spent two years. Mm -hmm. We have a huge archive on Napoleon, 17,000 images, pre-photography, all uh, re-photographed and mounted into IBM punch cards for sorting. That was the state of the art then. Mm -hmm. yeah? and, uh, but yeah, it didn't happen, and he was very, very sad. And uh, well, it may happen. It still may happen as a six-hour series. Wait, I'm working on it. <laughs> I have heard rumors about that. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you bring up that he, he was such a film buff, because from what I've read, that started very early at the Museum of Modern Art that would do daily screenings of films. And it was a place that a lot of young children and artists went to see films that they only had access to there, and it was 
affordable and exciting. And so beginning when he was a very young teenager, you know, he would go to the movies every night. And it's, it's wonderful to hear that that continued throughout his life. Yeah. I mean, seven films a weekend is quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was very frustrating, though. If you didn't like it, we didn't get to see past the first reel. <laughs> um, <laughs> if, we, if we didn't like it, we didn't get to see past the first reel. Um, or he would... Uh, so we would have movie nights, and Emilio would uh, go to Warner Brother, uh, Wardo Street and pick up, you know, three or four films, you know, tins, and we would put them in the projection room. And <clears throat> I learned how to rewind and splice. Um, and we would have Chinese takeout, and we had to be very careful because if the dogs came in with us and they eaten too much Chinese food, we would be gassed out by the third reel. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> You tell the best stories. I should just keep asking you questions. Is there any stories you're dying to tell? <laughs> Me? Yes. Any, any what sort of stories? Any stories you're dying to tell. <laughs> oh, um, what can I tell you? He was a very diligent dad. He was very protective, very involved, nosy. Um, if you were a boyfriend, God help you. God, it was just... I remember um, this boy came to pick me up. I think I was 17 or 18, and uh, picked me up, had dinner, got the look, you know, and um, and then we went out for dinner, and and I came back and um, was going up the stairs, and Daddy came out of the dining room, which he had turned into an office, and he just looked at me and he went, "You're kidding, right?" <laughs> yes, no, he was right. Um, so <laughs> Um, yeah, and he was, you know, he, we had dogs and cats and I rode horses and we had animals and my mother painted and we had greenhouses and it was very sort of enriched life. I was incredibly fortunate. Um, and he was, I think, organized his life perfectly. He was well known for his work, for his art, he was respected but his face wasn't known, so he could go down to St. Albans and buy his socks. Um, he could have parties at home. He, we had a lot of parties, um, contrary to um, received wisdom. And he was very, very sociable. And he was always on the phone, uh, <clears throat> talking to the world, it seemed. Uh, I think we refer to it as him being on telephonia um, because he was usually talking um, to, to, you know, somebody in Hollywood. Um, and, but he, he got to make his movies, um, sleep in his bed at night, you know, with his wife and his children. And I think he had it absolutely right. And when people say he was obsessed or e egocentric or, or misogynistic, I mean, he was, he was the only man. He was surrounded by women. Um, they couldn't be more wrong. They couldn't be more wrong. And, and so... You know, if there's anything that I can do in my small way to dispel, dispel those m mistakes about him, then that's, that's, what I, that's what I do. Now, we have a short amount of time for questions from the audience. Um, I just ask that you keep them brief, and please wait until you have a microphone um, to ask your question as we're recording this. Catherine, I, I have a cat-related question. Uh, could you tell us about uh, Polly? and the uh, painting and Eyes Wide Shut and the story behind that. Oh, yes. Um, if you've seen Eyes Wide Shut, in the Harford's apartment in the hallway, there is a massive, great big painting of a cat. That is Polly. And that's a painting I did of one of Dad's favorite cats, and I did it for his 60th birthday. And um, so I was really chuffed when it was featured so prominently um, in the movie. So, yeah, and I was, Daddy was incredibly superstitious. And I was just hoping that she wouldn't sort of suddenly snuff it after I'd finished the painting, that I'd, that I'd jinxed her. But luckily, she lived a few years after that. So yeah, that was Polly, daddy's favorite cat. So there's not a lot of interviews with Stanley. And I was wondering if um, maybe you have one or two that you would recommend as a must read, if there's anything from the published interviews with Stanley that would be really worthwhile. There are, there are some, uh, I mean, he didn't do many interviews, he, he, uh, but they were all published. After each film, there were two or three interviews he did so that he was 
you know, bit, bit helpful. He didn't like to doing it. And there were always the same journalists, you know, uh, Alexander Walker and uh, Michel Simon and so on. And he got to know these people. He didn't mind the people at all. He just didn't like to talk about his films. Why and, was that? Uh, but uh, they are published, yes. Mm. After okay. each film, you find them. Mm. Uh, and they are everywhere. I mean, you can't find that easily on Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think. Did, yeah, did, you, did you hear the one that he did with Jeremy Bernstein in the 60s? Okay, that, that was a tape, that was a CD that came out with the, the Taschen book, which you can, yeah. it's online, yeah. you know, you can, you can YouTube it, and it's him and Jeremy Bernstein, um, and he's asking him a series of questions, and, um, you know, there's a lot of giggling and smoking, and we've, we've actually, it's been edited, so all the ums and ers and all that sort of snuffling's been taken out, but that's quite good, because you can get to hear his voice. And also, I think there is a volume called Stanley Kubrick's The Interviews, edited by Gene D. Phillips. And it also comprises, a, I think, a selection of maybe eight or nine interviews, which I would recommend. Thank you. It's for Jan about the Napoleon Project. And I assume that he knew of the, the Abel Gantz film. And, and what, what was his, what did he want to do with the film of Napoleon that hadn't been? Right. He, he certainly didn't want to give a history lesson. He was aware that uh, everything is known about Napoleon, that can be known. It's the most published, uh, written about person almost in the world. About 5,000 publications exist. And so he knew that. What interested him is uh, that, that nothing has changed. That it was almost, I think his film would have been almost a current affairs program. Uh, because uh, what fascinated him about Paul, Napoleon, uh, the key part, is that this man, who came from nowhere uh, in Corsica, became a general at 24, crowned himself emperor uh, uh, in 1804, what was enormously loved by his people and by people outside of France. So this man, in this, this huge success, this man with this colossal charisma, then was not able to deal with a challenge when Tsar Alexander, uh, after 1807, or, or, or it was a peace treaty, uh, broke a treaty that had to do with he shouldn't deal with England, he shouldn't sell his goods to England, and he should have looked away, because one thing Napoleon was not, and that's a statesman, he was not. That was his weak point, and that, is, that leads directly to one of the things that Stanley always said. We are kidding ourselves. Everybody is kidding, and he didn't exclude himself. Then we think that we are governed in our decisions by our intellect, by our knowledge, by our ability to analyze, by our education. Well, it's all fine for the job we do, not for essential decisions. We are governed by our emotions. That's the danger, and that is shown again and again and again. And uh, you know, key decisions in our life, and particularly by our governments, and so are made on a basis of emotion. That's um, maybe very positive, but it has its drawbacks, <laughs> as we have seen last week in England. Yeah. <laughs> we also we have a lot of questions up front. If we could get the mic up here next. Uh, okay, I'll just answer uh, or ask this question uh, quickly. Um, I I'm curious, uh, what attracted him uh, most to projects? Was it um, uh, ideas and themes that he wanted to explore, and then he would wait until he found the right story to tell it? Because um, I know that with the Aryan Papers, you said that he really wanted to make a Holocaust movie for a very long time, um, and then so waited until he, he found the right story. I'm just curious. Um, was it a, a particular story that drove him, or was it ideas and themes that he wanted to explore? Did you get that? It's a little bit long. Could you summarize that? <laughs> Sorry. I, I couldn't understand the question. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know um, what really attracted him to uh, potential projects. Was it an idea or a theme that he wanted to explore, or any particular story? Uh, it's, it's the biggest secret of what, an, what drives an artist. It, it, there are lots of description for this moment when you have an idea. It's the idea. Some people say it's the kiss of the muse. You fall in love with something. And, and, and without that, you can, never, you can never make a great work of art. You, you know, film production is a manufacturing process. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's relatively simple. 
to make it into a work of art, you need an artist. And, and this is a great mystery. What is a great painter? How, how do you, what do you do? I mean, what drives you to do a great painting? Or do a great, have the talent to do a, a symphony? Or be a fantastic architect? Yeah, it's, it's not given to most people, it's certainly not given to me. Yeah? And, and, but I admire it. And I saw in Kubrick and in other artists this burning. And, and I, I, recall, I always refer to it, it's like a falling in love. It's like falling in love. It has that quality and, uh, uh, and, and immediately changes all priorities. Yeah, well, um, I'm, yeah, it, it's impossible to, uh, to answer this properly. I, I remember that he was once asked by a journalist, what made you choose Barry Lyndon? And he looked at him rather blank and he said, well, you may as well ask me, why did I marry my wife? What did Stanley struggle with most while making his films? You know, with everything. <laughs> I mean, he was so, everybody was satisfied with what he did before he was. He was incredibly self-critical, but that was also his strengths. I mean, he could shoot a scene for a week and decide that this was really not good. And it's no, he, he didn't blame anybody else other than himself. And he re did it again. And um, uh, yeah, that takes great courage. He, he said in, a, in, a, in one of those rare interviews uh, that exist, he was asked, what is the most difficult thing to make a film? And his answer was, well, I think Steven Spielberg summed it up beautifully. And he, I repeat this, the most difficult thing to make a film is getting out of the car. And, yeah, and I know exactly what, what he means, and I have observed it many times. A filmmaker is alone, is an absolutely loner. Yeah. Okay, you have brilliant actors, you need them, they're all artists. You have designers and costume and makeup and hair and sound and cinematography. None of them make a great film. They all contribute. It's the filmmaker, the amalgamation of writer and director into the filmmaker. That person is responsible. If you don't like anything about an Ingmar Bergman or, or Steven Spielberg film, don't go and complain with the actors. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's that per person. Yeah. So he struggled all the time. But I have to say, none of his films disappeared. That's the result. And that's the mark of a great artist, that his work remains for a next generation. And I predict that Eyes Wide Shut will have a renaissance for people who are now maybe still at primary school. <laughs> uh, just wondering, do you have a reaction you want to share to the documentary Room 237? Uh, yes. I mean, you know, the film could never have been made during his life. Maybe that answers us already. Could never have been made while he was alive. Um, it is what, what I don't really mind people doing things like this. It's fine. It's okay. And everybody's entitled to have an interpretation. Well, what I minded very, very, very much, and I happened to talk this morning to two gentlemen about it, is that this incredible lie uh, that Arte in France made, made you know, was repeated. The Arte in France made a film uh, saying that Kubrick, in fact, filmed for the US government and NASA, a faked moon landing <laughs> in, case, in case the original moon landing shouldn't work. Now, this is three insults in one. It, 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 it insults Kubrick that he would do such a thing. It insults the US government and NASA, yeah, that they might even contemplate this. Now, okay, uh, if you look at this film very carefully, then you realize it's a hoax. So they made sure that, it, but people don't look at television carefully. They check their email while they're watching it. And therefore, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people didn't notice that it was a hoax. And I wasted so much time answering letters and telephone calls. How could Kubrick do this? It is absolutely terrible. Now, this film, this film 237, repeats it knowingly, knowingly that this was a lie. Now, that's not nice. So, that's what I think about this film. 
Um, this question is for Jan and for Tim. Um, can you speak about the archive? This seems to be one of the most comprehensive archives of any film director. Um, how is it that it came together? Um, and what does it reveal about the filmmaking process? I think it is, uh, it is a working archive, as Jan and Katarina have already mentioned, um, the way that Kubrick was working and living in St. Albans, being capable of managing his productions from this central command unit, you can say, um, being able to bring his collaborators to his, to his workplace. And um, in the manor and the house and the estate of Stanley Kubrick, we found hundreds and hundreds of uh, boxes containing material related to all of his projects and all of his films. And um, during a eight month period, the film museum um, had an archivist over there in St. Albans, a colleague of mine whose name is Bernd. And uh, Bernd was living with Christian Kubrick and um, sifting through all these materials and um, meticulously um, filing those things up and, and putting them in a order related to the projects and um, furnishing us as a curatorial team in Frankfurt um, with the results put in a database. So we were able to start um, making a curatorial, um, our curatorial proceedings reflecting upon the richness of the material. And it was pretty clear from the first, the first time we envisioned the richness of the material that the exhibition had to somehow reflect upon it. So this is why um, we'll find in the Stanley Kubrick exhibition more than 1,000 um, elements comprised various media and various materials, and uh, altogether they they form a sort of tribute to to his work and to his working methods. So we really intended to um, give the visitors, the audience, a uh, look behind the scenes or uh, insight into his his workshop, you can say. And the archive is, is now in London at the University of the Arts. Um, and from what I understand, it's very accessible to researchers and students. Oh, yeah. and the University of Arts has, um, so four, four years after the um, premiere presentation in Frankfurt was held, the material went from St. Albans to the University of the Arts in London, where it is kept now. And the university have, has set up a really nice Stanley Kubrick archive. And every scholar or journalist or film student can go there and, um, and look at the other materials. The exhibition contains um, what, a selection that we made that we uh, considered uh, um, a meaningful and attractive selection that, that reflects upon his working methods. But there are so many, many more elements, so many, many more artifacts, um, ephemera, um, that it's impossible to include all of them in one presentation. One day, one day they will, of course, get everything that's in the exhibition. But now it goes from here uh, to Mexico, and then to Mexico City, then to, to Hong Kong, and then back to Europe. And so, but one day, you know, in 10 years, or who knows when, it will come out. Then the University of the Arts will, will get all this stuff. And I'm not quite sure whether this is a threat or a promise. <laughs> <laughs> And, and also the University of the Arts, they have uh, supported um, uh, books and publications recently. So there has been, as I said, the Napoleon book, but there has also been released a beautiful um, tribute to 2001, which uh, contains many illustrations and, and uh, conceptual drawings. And the whole production history of 2001 can be found in this book. Thank you, Tim. Well, that concludes our panel, and I want to thank our guests very much. It's been such a pleasure to have you here in San Francisco. Um, and I encourage everyone to come back many times. And in the program guide, you'll see details about all of the screenings we'll be doing around town. Um, also, a special performance by the San Francisco Symphony of 2001, which is not to be missed. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you.